We're talking about canceling student debt. Hi, Tamia. How are you? It's great to see you. Oh, it's great to see you too. And 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 on happy, you know, <laughs> happy terms. Uh, oh my gosh, I know, right? I feel like. I lost 200 pounds after <laughs> last week's events. So it feels yes. good. Yes. So Biden's getting ready to be sworn in. Uh, progressives are vocal about how the agenda should be shaped. And one of the things that's been coming to light, uh, as you put in your Twitter this past week, has been uh, the canceling of student loan debt. Jamia Wilson, you are here to talk about this. You're the executive director and publisher of the Feminist Press at the City University of New York and the former Women, Action, and Media Executive Director. Also, by the way, author of Big Ideas for Young Thinkers, Young, Gifted, and Black, and Step Into Your Power, among others. Jamia, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Thrilled to be joining you on this side of it. Yes, like I just, I felt a big weight off my back that feels much lighter. And I hope you feel the same, just like I was carrying a few hundred pounds of rocks and now they're gone. I do. It's really nice to not be in resistance, but to be kind of pushing for. Yes. And what are we for, right? That's what it's about. Yes. Exactly. What do you think of this push to cancel the student loan debt that, that's been going around? As one of the millions of Americans with student loan debt that has dictated most of my adult decisions, including decisions about parenting, decisions about health care, I am 100 percent on board with canceling student debt, and especially around the timing of, of when I accrued my student debt and really just thinking about um the fact that we should have never had predatory lending and percentages of debt um, being allowable in our country for people to sign on for, mm. or for people who are not even yet adults to be able to sign on for. Uh, I think that um, for me, this would be one of the greatest uh, joys and victories of my lifetime, or progressive victories, is canceling student debt and figuring out a real ways to make educational sustainable for everyone. And we need to have free college. I think about this issue as also an issue around political engagement and civil engagement, because they showed that if you looked at the voters and you looked at the people who um, supported change, many of those were people who were college educated voters across mm -hmm. demographics. And so I connect this issue with free college as well as canceling student loan debt and making um, education affordable to everyone as being a, a help and a boost to our economy, but also to the education of our populace. It does seem that canceling student loan debt is a great first step to making college free so that people who are like, hey, I'm still paying 60 grand for school for 30, from 15 years ago, um, they won't be so mad about college being free for people. Absolutely. I, it's so interesting. I had, you know, whenever I hear, I have a lot of people saying, well, what do you, what do you think about the people who've been paying off their student loans? Aren't they going to be mad? And I'm thinking, I'm really glad that my ancestors weren't thinking oh, you know, I'm not going to fight to end Jim Crow because I had to endure it. So the next generation should suffer like I did or mm -hmm. my feminist foremothers if they would say the same, right? Like, oh, I didn't have Roe v. Wade, so this next generation shouldn't have it. It makes no sense to me. It only makes sense to the very selfish uh, <laughs> and and the forces who stoke selfishness in our country. And I don't understand, you know, I, hopefully... It, I want to bring to the conversation this idea that an educated populace is actually good for the entire population, the entire country. Can you talk about that? Yes. I think about other countries who really focus their public monies in really strategic ways and really invest in education and looking at how that impacts all of their social realities and systems. And although there's no perfect structure that we've yet seen um, in, in modern times and in history yet, we can see that in those countries where we invest in teachers, where we invest in education from K through college, that you do see a more educated populace. I, I think a lot about some systems as well, um, like in France, for example, where there is not a perfect system, but there is a system where most people there are learning about critical thinking and learning about debate and all of those things at an early age. It's a part of the teaching. And 
that's something that we should be putting into our our curriculum, not just at private schools, but at public schools, not just at charter schools, but at, at public schools, and not just at um, the s institutions that the wealthiest people can afford. It's something that we all need. And I think it's also really important to me that we make sure that education isn't just about training people to be good laborers mm. in a workforce, but instead to be people who ask important questions, who innovate and who transform and heal. That's what we need mm. to move away from this industrial revolution informed system. And instead we need to move toward a system where we are really building knowledge, building connection and empathy and teaching people social emotional learning in schools as well. Oh, I've always thought about starting a thing where we teach social emotional learning in schools. <laughs> I yeah. thought, yeah, maybe we can team up on that. It's a good idea. I love that. Um, is canceling student loan debt a racial justice issue also? 100%. You know, when you look at the numbers of the people who are saddled with uh, the most damaging impact of student loan debt and those who are most targeted by predatory lenders, it's the most marginalized communities who are vulnerable to this kind of stifling debt. And so to me, it's very much a racial justice issue. And, and when we think about this also being compounded with immigration injustice and the need to reform and radically transform our immigration system, it's also um, a racial justice and immigration issue. I think about when I was teaching, just having students who were dreamers, who were fearing for their families, fearing for their own lives, fearing for the sustainability of their own education. And in addition to trying to figure out how to continue to fund their education. So there's just so, so many multi-layered social issues that need to be addressed as it relates to student debt. And uh, I think about the generational impact as well. I'm the child of two parents who were paying off their student loans well into my remember my, my memory. So I feel like my parents were maybe into their 50s mm -hmm. by the time they were paying their student loans. I was born when they were in their 30s. And what does that mean? That I am also in that same trajectory, mm -hmm. but paying more loans because the predatory interest rates became higher over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that that's just also a generational issue that is also happening across racial lines and across all sorts of other systemic inequity lines that um, we're not just stifling generational growth, we're stifling multi-generational growth in entire communities. Other than what Elizabeth Warren did for the banking sector um, two administrations ago, it seems that, well, Trump certainly hasn't, but even Democratic um, leaders and potentially Joe Biden are loath, if that's not too strong of a word, to put any kind of regulations on banks and canceling student debt and predatory, which is predatory lending, is a roundabout way of punishing or righting an injustice done done by the banks. Do you Do you see it that way as well? I think when we really think about neoliberal politics, right, and this fear that if we were to ever, that we, if we were to move away from this corporate personhood idea of treating corporations like people, and instead actually focus on people over profits, um, that 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 would somehow alienate people who we need. And if anything, what this election has shown me, which is what I've always believed, is that the people who showed up, turned out, and turned up for change are the people who are most affected adversely by these injustices, not those whom these injustices continue to uphold power for. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I'd like to see more accountability and I think that that will be rewarded by the multitudes and the new voters who are coming up now who weren't able to vote with us in this election, but were very integral in the organizing that came forth within it. So uh, I think that what is also important to remember, and I've had this argument with many different people who, you know, might have more economic privilege than myself and aren't convinced yet about the student debt issue, but are progressive on social issues, is that this is a bipartisan issue. I know many people on many sides of the aisle who are saddled with student debt from my generation and the generation before me. And I believe that any administration that would make massive student debt reform 
would see returns on that. One, it's the right thing to do, but I also think as a political calculus that um, it would be interesting to see what would happen because there are many people, student loans don't discriminate against you based on your party lines when you sign up for them and, and how you're voting. And so I know many people who have said to me that, that they would be inspired to vote based on how their student loans were affected. And I, I definitely um, am a student loan voter. It's it's absolutely something that is so tangible to people um, that I think it it can have that kind of effect. Joe Biden has committed committed to canceling up to ten thousand dollars of student loan debt, but not all of your student loan debt. Why is it important to cancel all of the student loan debt? My perspective is that it's not the fault of the people that our system isn't uphold, held to a point where that we can provide educational and affordable, accessible way. And that there is money if we were to reallocate funds in a way that puts the money back in the hands of the people who are paying into the tax system um, that could be reallocated for this purpose and moved out of some other places that may not so much serve the people. Mm -hmm. And so that is just uh, something that, that I really firmly believe I do understand why some people are really concerned about this idea of all being something that, um, you know, is scary in terms of their way of seeing the world and how they see this particular republic functioning. But there are many other countries and many of our allies who have a model where people are able to pay accessible and affordable uh, tuitions to go to school. And as long as you are attending school, doing what you need to do, et cetera, you can know that you're going to be supported and that you're going to be getting the support you need um, to thrive in your institution and that um, you don't have to sacrifice your health. You don't have to sacrifice um, the ability to build your family. I also think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I also think that uh, if you cancel $10,000 of student loans and someone has a 40 or $50,000 student loan, which is not that much considering how much schooling costs these days, even if it's a state institution, you're not getting out of there with less than 40 grand. And that's, you know, if you sped it up and did it three years, um, canceling $10,000 means that student loan holders would, I guess, refinance their loans or the loans would be refinanced for them. Will there be any, um, you know, regulations placed on the amount of uh, interest that the bank can get? You know, I just feel like they're going it's going to sound great, like they just gave me $10,000, but it's not going to turn out to be that great. Your thoughts? As someone who's been paying mine for over a decade, um, I, you know, just it's disheartening to see how with the interest rates, that number continues to stay really close to the same. And you see it whittling down bit by bit, bit by bit, bit by bit, but that, you know, to make a real sea change to get past those predatory interest rates, you need more than $10,000 in order to really see that change. Otherwise, if you still aren't able to make those payments, if we still aren't paying people with wage equity in mind, if we still, especially in COVID with so many people with lost jobs, um, it's not going to be able to create that seismic change we need. Um, maybe for some people, a ripple, but for those who are most marginalized, it would still be a struggle. Now, of course, what I welcome having a sense of temporary relief, sure. But what I think would be really powerful would be more like a $50,000 commitment. Um, because that would really create a sea change mm -hmm. uh, for all of the people who are affected and impacted, a $50,000 or more. We are very lucky to have gotten rid of Betsy DeVos because the, the writing on the wall in terms of Betsy DeVos was basically she was going to make college unaffordable. She wasn't going to allow uh, forgiveness of student loan debt while people go into all kinds of economic distress because of COVID. It's not just going to stop with, you know, people who work at the grocery store, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna continue to ripple out. And then she would cause this, like a debt slavery for people. Sure, we already feel like we're debt slaves. But at least you've got a job and you're paying it and you have a roof over your head. But I, you know, I, I had this sense she was just gonna come for everything, your house, your car. I mean, most people don't even have the house yet. If they're still paying off, you know, $350 a month in student loans. Your, your thoughts about the bullet that we just dodged? 
I mean, I've been concerned about her from day one and, you know, especially to have someone who's profited from the system that has sidelined so many of us. Of course, she wants to uphold a structure that she's profiting from, that her family has profited from for so long. And so I'm happy to be moving away from an administration where someone like that would have power over our entire educational system. And so, you know, I, I think that right now we have to do a lot of recovery. And I think that's the thing that is in my heart right now, my concern about we have a, a sense of the damage that we need to assess, but you know, how do, how do we also fund the recovery that we each independently need, but that our schools need, that our communities need, that our organizations and educational communities need and public educational nonprofits, et cetera. So that just the recovery that's needed from the impact of an administration that was bad on education. Uh, that's the kind of thing that keeps me up at night. How are we going to contribute to to that transformation, to healing what has been hurt? Jamia Wilson, executive director and publisher of Feminist Press at City University of New York and uh, author of several books that I suggest that you go get immediately. Jamia, canceling student loan debt has been named one of the things that Biden can do within within his first 10 days in office. What else do you think should be on that list? Oh, so many things. I mean, Paris Accord. We need to be good on climate. We need to go right back in there, rejoin the World Health Organization. Things that I thought I would never have come out of my mouth, right? I right. couldn't have predicted this, and I like to read dystopian fiction. But <laughs> those those would be some of the first steps that I would like to see. Um, you know, um, I would like to see some real action taken around protections against people who are targeted by hate crimes and marginalization. I have a feeling that um, the aftermath and effects of what we are living in right now will continue with this trend that we've seen with this administration of the emboldening of hate groups and white supremacists and anti-Semites and anti-Islamic people. So I just had a run in at the grocery store. Oh my I'm, gosh. I'm, I'm so only marginally ethnic looking. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was it was exactly what you would think. Um, it's unacceptable. Unacceptable, maskless. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't understand why not wearing a mask and coughing at someone is not considered something that you could pull stand your ground laws to back them off of you with. Oh my god! And I want to shoot a guy, but hey, if he's coughing in my face with no mask in a grocery store on purpose. You would think stand your ground laws, if you have them in the state, would protect you from that. I don't know. Just a thought. We've gotten off topic. Oh, it's awful. I mean, <laughs> I was thinking about this idea of, you know, um, using biological aggression, right? That's what I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, weapon I feel like you and I often have... <laughs> A good mind meld going on. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. No, I'm I'm with you. I, when I remember early on in the pandemic, hearing a story about some of these, you know, anti-masker death, death sort of drive, driven people, as I call it, death drive, death cult, um, sneezing on vegetables on purpose, right? Things like that at the store, just, you know, and, and calling it liberty. And that's the kind of... Um, that's disgusting, number one, so disgusting. but also disgusting on every level. And the individualism, right? I mean, that's what I want us to move away from is this culture and the cult of individualism and thinking that there's somehow any merit in not caring about your neighbor and not caring about humanity. Because and my belief is that if you don't care about humanity, you don't care about yourself. But somehow we have emboldened over the past four years specifically this attitude of, you know, it's just about me and mine and it doesn't matter who you are and what you think. And I've been watching The Crown over the weekend and thinking a lot about Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism and, you know, just seeing how we've been battling this force, these forces of uh, people who understand that the collective uh, is important versus those who really believe that, you know, it's only important to be an individual and it's only important to be individualistic. But what we've seen which is heartening me is that in spite of this pandemic, in spite of all the things that we've seen, that the things that have brought us the kind of change we need have been people coming together, people building together, collaborating and fighting against these forces, not in an individualist mindset, not in an individualist practice, but together. And so I, every time I see it, I'm just kind of thinking, who can I build with, right? That 
It's supposed to alienate us, right? Coughing at someone, you're supp it's supposed to alienate and destroy. And instead we, we don't do that. We come together mm -hmm. and that's really powerful. And they, and they understand that opponents to justice, opponents to humanity really do understand the merits of collectivism. They just prefer to remain selfish. Jamia Wilson, executive director and publisher of Feminist Press at City University of New York. She is the author of Big Ideas for Young Thinkers, Young, Gifted and Black and Step Into Your Power. Among others, follow Jamia at on Twitter at Jamia, J-A-M-I-A-W. Jamia, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being on the program with us today. It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, under such nice circumstances. Well, thanks for having me. And such a pleasure to see you. And thank you for always speaking truth to power. You too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We bring you these kinds of interviews that we hope you will enjoy four days a week.